we can start with the elephant in the room. Obviously, e almost immediately, there is a loss of some family, some friends, um, and as a former pastor, some former mentors uh, as well. Hey, this is Michael Beverly. We've been having a little bit of cold spell. That's why I'm wearing a cap. As I think I mentioned before, I live in Guadalajara where the weather is very temperate and usually very nice, but <clears throat> the winters can get down to zero. Right now we're having a little bit of rain, which is unusual because this is normally the dry season. Anyways, in my browsing through YouTube, the algorithm surfed up this former pastor and I really liked his style and his message. So a couple things. One, Check him out. I'll put a link to this video and and check out his channel. It's it's um he's got some good content and <clears throat> I think that I think we should do we should do as much as we can to help promote all of these types of um, deconstruction stories and and you know stories from ex-christians like myself I, you know, I was never a professional christian i was a lay leader and i did spend almost four decades in the church so um yeah, i'm not going to show the whole video he has you can go look it out but there was a couple things that struck me as cool and noteworthy so i'm going to show a couple clips respond on that and you know i generally respond to christian videos so i thought you know i'll I should start responding to some more. Uh, I believe that, you know, whatever's going on with you is the devil and, and things of that nature. Yeah, I get this. I, I understand the Christian position here. It's like it's like when Paul found out that this guy is is in a sexual relationship with like his stepmom or something. And he says, how why are you tolerating that? Don't, you know, kick him out so that Satan can like destroy his flesh and maybe he'll come back. And there's actually another letter that people think of, refers to the same guy that like he had repented, but the church was still punishing him. And he, Paul's like, no, the guy's now you're going to, you're, you're going to make him despondent. Like he's, he's quit his behavior and asked for forgiveness. So I understand the Christian thing. It's just sad. It's sad that their ideology and their commitment to stuff that Paul wrote, is so strong that they would throw out friendships. And I, there's a quote by uh, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Nisam Taleb, the guy that wrote The Black Swan and Fooled by Randomness and, and Anti-Fragile. He said, look, a friendship that can end was never really a friendship. And if there's anything, if, if you can name something about why someone's your friend, like a reason, they're not really your friend. Like you're a business associate or there's some other thing. And I, and I, you know, maybe that's a little cynical, but I find it to be true. So, but, you know, I don't want to be accused like Christians say, you were never a Christian. I don't want to say to these guys, you were never really my friends. Like I get it. I get their brainwashed and they had to, they had to all blackball me and blacklist me and ghost me. And guess what? You know, like in some sense, I feel bad about it. I had some good friends that never spoke to me again when I became an atheist. Like ne they didn't even send me a goodbye message. They just ghosted me. And that was hurtful and hard. At the end of the day, though, guess what? I replaced all you motherfuckers like that. I have, ton I have more friends than I have time to spend with. And yeah, lately I've been kind of isolated and spending most of my time with my girlfriend and the dogs. If you get a chance, check out the Can Atheists Experience Miracles video about a happy and sad story about some of my puppies. And I also run a I run a meetup. So every so I socialize every Thursday night um, and I see a lot of people. And again, you know, it's like if you if you if you're secure in yourself and you're not being dominated by these spiritual, you know, bullshitty things. Just be yourself. I don't care how weird you are or how what your hobbies are or what you're as long as you're not like don't don't be an asshole. Like as long as you're not coercion using coercion and and hurting people in that sense. Like as long as as long as things are consensual and good, there's always gonna be somebody that likes to do the shit you do. Whether you're a nerdy sci fi guy or you like fishing and hunting. But by this point, I had decided to stop living my life as a victim of circumstances, and I became okay with separating from relationships that didn't produce healthy outcomes anyway. Okay, so uh, Durante describes his his, his deconstruction process as taking a long time, like he says, over 10 years. Mine happened a lot faster, so it was a lot more of a shock. It was more of a sh 
like it was a shock to my friends it was a shock to me um but i eventually figured out what he just said and how true it is like you want to be in relationships that are productive for your well-being so let me say that again you you need to be selfish about your health you need to be selfish about your well-being now that doesn't mean you need to be a selfish person guess what i get off on being generous i love to be generous in fact people criticize me sometimes for being too generous like when i get in a tight spot and i'm broke as fuck they're like well sometimes this comes from my kid's dad think about what you did and i'm like yeah i know i look i don't regret it and i've made some dumb decisions I, I but i never regret being generous and i never regret you know like i try just to live not i just try to live without regret I try to live that way like you know if 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 you're if you're if you're being selfish in a in a way that's for your own well-being and you have empathy that will naturally flood into you being a good and generous person to others sometimes puppies my, my girlfriend's that way she lets she loves to rescue puppies and kittens and sometimes she drives me crazy but i try to support her because i recognize that her her dark satan influenced heart <laughs> her yeah <laughs> The, the ugliness that Satan influences on her uh, gets her to be totally, totally loving and kind to little street puppies that she rescues. And guess what? She's also one of the most generous people to other people, um, often to her own detriment as well, which is, I think is why we get along. So be good to yourself. That means separate yourself from relationships that with people that are hurting you and quite often religious people with an agenda when they find out you're deconstructing it all or questioning your faith at all and especially if you just come to the conclusion hey i'm an atheist now or maybe you just say look i'm not really an atheist but i don't really believe in christianity like i kind of think there's a god but like i know that this fundamentalist is wrong and then people start treating you differently get away from that i've realized kind of that superstition is sort of a manifestation of dysfunction um at least in some regard so i don't necessarily expect healthy uh healthy responses um from um dysfunctional postures right superstition is a manifestation of dysfunction it was very profound what he just said and i'd like to say the opposite is is also true that dysfunction often ends up manifesting superstition and how does that work well when 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 i was a christian i used to spend a lot of time being sad and depressed because i felt like god wasn't you know answering me or he was blocking my opportunity because i wanted to serve him like oh i want to go to bio college and be a pastor or be you know something in the ministry and and i i don't see the door for that and why doesn't god want me um so again there there's not a necessarily a direct a direct cause and effect but they do go together both the superstition leads to dysfunction and the dysfunction leads to superstition the more of dysfunction you have the the easier it is to to find agency in why things are fucked up in your life whether you're you know you're just not good at staying at a steady job or you're not good at business or you're not good with money or you have addictions with substances or behavior it's easy to blame those on something outside yourself and that's not to say that people you know we don't pick the we don't pick the circumstances of our birth which you know i keep repeating this to christians so you know dude if you were born in if you're born in jakarta you'd probably be a muslim so a lot of these circumstances that we find ourselves in like it's like that that goodwill hunting scene with with um with aladdin uh and mark uh, uh robin williams um it, it's not your fault he says it's not your fault now th you can't use this as an adult to excuse all your dysfunction and say it's all my parents fault like when you it, you know but it does take a while like 
when you're when you're 12 years old or six years old most of your circumstances are good or bad have nothing to do with you it's just it's just random it's a function of fate and when you're 20 when you're in your 20s you're trying to work out all the shit your parents put on you when you're in your 30s you start to figure it out for me i you know i think i don't think i was into my 40s before i really realized what was going on and it wasn't into my 50s that i kind of started getting free from all the trappings of life and can think for myself Anyways, I thought that what he just said was was profound and true. So if you can think of it this way, for those of you that still speak Bible, <laughs> uh, Jesus offered to ask, ask a certain person if they wanted to be healed. And the text says the sick man responded. And that's what you get. If, if, if you're kind of living in the uh, sickness of superstition, that superstition is always going to respond until you've decided to put yourself in some type of functional uh, posture. So what I've realized is that everything I lost as an atheist when it comes to those things was really only an illusion of things that I never really had anyway. Yeah, I just talked about this idea in, my, in the video, the doggy video with Silly Dog on the cover. It's can, a, can, can an atheist be convinced and it's about atheist miracles. And my point was I had something in, happen in my life that had I been a Christian, I would have assigned to as an answer to prayer and a miracle. Like it, it, in, the, in the natural vernacular, what happened was like a miracle to me. Like it was very, like very unusual, but like it, it wasn't supernatural. Um, I got lucky. And so um, the point here is, and you, and you won't realize this if you're a Christian until you leave, if you do, or at least till you set aside some of this, like offshoring your life to Jesus, you won't realize how much that belief in, in superstition has hurt you. So now here's an obvious example. When I was on prayer teams for healing, one of our instruction was, Never tell anyone to go off their medicine. Tell them if they feel better to go see their doctor. And I understood the practical reason for that and the religious, re the, the the secular, like you don't, insurance, you don't want to be sued, blah, blah. But I never understood the spiritual side. Like if somebody, if somebody was really healed and they really believed they were healed, like why would they keep taking medicine? And so the, the obvious answer is because Christians know they aren't really healed by prayer. They just play pretend, but they're so convinced by the play pretending as I was that it's real. My point of that is, is we can, see, we, when, when you're in a Christian church and somebody has cancer, you don't expect them not to go to the doctor and get radiation and chemo. And if they get healed, you praise God. God answered the miracle, even though the doctors and the radiation, the chemo is is why they got better right you know you will they'll come up with an excuse what god you know god worked with the doctors or something that one's an obvious one but there's other things where it's not obvious and that's what i really want to keep key in on here if you're a christian take the cancer and chemothera chemotherapy analogy into other little things in your life because what you do, if you're typical, is that you you expect God to to move, and there, you know, like let's say it's about, let's say it's you want to get an advanced degree, or you want, or you're, you're maybe you're younger, you don't even have a college education yet, and you're and you're you're trying to decide what to go into, and so you'll pray about it and pray about, it and you'll and you'll put out a fleece, and you'll expect God to give you some confirmation, and you'll and you'll expect God to open doors and close doors. And what that does is it offshores your agency about stuff and it prohibits you from making your own right choices and bad choices. So some of the worst fucking choices I've made in my life ended up leading to good results. Now, I'm not recommending doing bad things for good results because sometimes you do bad stuff, it's you can't recover from it. But um, the... Take that verse, God works for the good to those that love him. Like Christians stand on that. Like, well, yes, I know this. I know when the drunk driver hit my family's car and killed two of my kids and my wife's now crippled in a wheelchair and and I've lost my job. Jesus works out everything for good. What happens when you do that is you is you 
you take the responsibility for making these decisions and sometimes there's there's just no good decision sometimes life just fucking sucks but you take that and you put it on god's shoulders and then when things don't work out how you want them to or how you expect them to or how you hope them to you know you know it's not orthodox to blame god so what do you do you blame yourself and and it ends it leads to so much pain and so much unnecessary agony because if you'll just do the obvious here and realize there ain't God ain't doing nothing for you. He's not answering your prayers. He's not moving mountains for you. I don't care if you have a faith as big as a million mustard seeds. You you can't pray for the mountain to go into the sea. That verse is bullshit. And the dogs are going crazy, so I must be saying something important. Don't fall for that type of thinking. Look in the mirror and tell yourself the truth. My life is my responsibility. And while I can count on hopefully family and friends that love me, while I can count on them for the most part and, 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 and you know, hopefully they help you. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for your life. I'm responsible for my life. Now, just speaking a little bit more from my own experience, what did it feel like for me? For me, becoming an atheist, and especially this recent experience of stepping out of the prayer closet, as I've heard it called, uh, it, for me, it felt like I was getting up from the children's table. Yep, exactly. And this is the exact same thing that I mean when I tell Christians in my videos, grow up, grow up. There, there's... Obviously, as an atheist, I don't think you have a loving father in heaven. Now, as a Christian, you do think that, but ask yourself, does he act anything like a loving father that's a human being that you've witnessed in your life, whether it's your own dad or any dad's of friends that you, you recognize as being a good dad? Answer, no. So getting up from the children's table Part of the process is taking responsibility for your own life, not expecting, like, even if God exists, do you, do you really want to be a child? Really? Um, the 20 years of ministry, uh, 20 plus years of ministry that I was involved in, I saw a lot of incredibly petty behavior. Um, oh my goodness, just, just mind-blowingly uh, <laughs> petty. And so it felt like finally getting up from that. And it's like, oh, snap, I think all of these people are just childish. I think these are all children in adult bodies. And I know exactly what he's talking about. And if you've been in the church for more than about a week, you know, too. You know about the pettiness and the gossiping and the backstabbing and the lies and the double standards and blah, 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 blah. Now. Among my atheist or non-believing friends or secular friends, or, you know, people I'm friends with that maybe I've never even talked about beliefs with, you know, I kind of assume they're not super religious if they hang out with me, but it is what it is, right? So when I look at those, is is there also, because I, I, I can already hear the Christian apologist saying, well, yeah, that's human, you know, we're humans and you can't possibly say in your in your atheism that you don't run across people that are petty or yeah but guess what i don't have to i don't have to be around those people i can kick them out of my life i don't have to put up their bullshit i don't i don't have rules coming down saying oh well we're supposed to be the body of christ and now i know because i was in the church for a long time and my mom was a pastor and i had friends that were pastors and i was friends with lay leaders and home group leaders i know <laughs> Look, I know that people have a way to distance themselves from problematic people. I get it. So I'm not saying that in in Christian circles, people don't protect themselves from, you know, like the 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 soul sucking vampires. But they still they still have to put up with a lot of bullshit because they're instructed by Jesus and the Bible and their leadership, you know, to be loving and kind and. I am not in any way saying not to be loving and kind, but what I'm saying it goes back to what I said before. When you're an atheist, you can you have yourself and you can say to yourself without guilt or shame, I'm going to be selfish about protecting my health, my mental health, 
most importantly, but you know, my physical health and my well-being in general. So if somebody's a douchebag, like I can block them on the phone or block them on social media or block them in my life and not have anything to do with them. And I can feel good about it. I don't have to feel any guilt like that, you know, God's convicting me. Maybe I should invite him to lunch. No, I don't, I don't have to put up with that shit anymore. Because I'm free. You might try it sometime. That was just like, holy snap, I'm with, the, I'm with the rest of the world now. I no longer have to pretend like 2,000 years of progress did not happen. Um, and so, so, so that, that's kind of my experience. What I find most harmful about religious superstition is number one, first and foremost, magical thinking. Um, everywhere that I've found, and again, just speaking from my experience, and of course this is subjective because this is observational, um, but speaking from my experience, almost everywhere that I've seen magical thinking a a as abundant, uh, poverty has been inevitable because what you create in that type of situation uh, are, are people who cannot take responsibility for what's happening in their lives uh, cannot see how their decisions connect with outcomes uh, and cannot really believe in themselves in their own capacity because they're always waiting for something else to make something happen and when things don't happen they create these magical reasons why as opposed to going back to the drawing board and figuring out how to make it make it happen so it's an incredible uh it's, it's an incredible thievery of human capacity an incredible thievery of human capacity that last clip described my almost my entire fucking life i wish i had heard this when i was in my 20s and somebody had beat it into me christianity stole so much from me Part of the reason that I do what I do on YouTube, besides the fact it's fun and besides the fact that I, I like the history and yada, yada, yada. And I, and I have the background of Christianity to hopefully be effective at this because guess what? If you say I was not a real Christian, you're just a fucking asshole. I was a real Christian. I love Jesus. I served Jesus for nearly 40 years. I, I didn't always do perfect things things i wasn't always the best servant but i loved jesus and i had the holy spirit so i thought so this this idea the thievery of the human potential i was fucked i could have done so much more with my life had i had the knowledge and understanding that i have now back in my 20s so take this as a warning. Like you don't have to believe the stuff that I'm saying is true. You can you can say no, I I believe God's real and I believe Jesus is real. Fine. But take some of what I'm saying, take some of my experience. Maybe part of your Christian walk could be improved by not expecting God to do stuff that he just doesn't do. Whether he exists or doesn't exist, doesn't matter. You know I'm telling you the truth. You know God, if you had the choice between a loving earthly father who loved you and nurtured you and told you good things about yourself and showed up every time for um, soccer practice and helped you with your homework, and gave you a sense of well-being and kept you well-fed and in a nice house, would you trade that? Would you trade that to live in utter poverty in some part of the world where you were subjected to malaria and disease and had a, and had a shitty father, but you had Jesus? Be honest. Be, on, be honest. God is not helping you. God is an anchor. God belief is an anchor around your neck and it's drowning you from experiencing your full potential. Anyways, this is Michael Beverly. I'm not going to, I'm going to end it here. There's more in that clip. It's good. Um, I just, I was trying to keep this short, so I'm going to end it here. Um, go check out his channel. Listen, or, you know, I'll put the link to this, this actual video. He, he's got some really good stuff to say, and I hope you've taken something from what I've said as being helpful. Um, there you go. Like, subscribe, share, do all the good stuff, and have a great day.